Well, the last video I made was done pretty well. There were a lot of ums, there were a lot of uhs, but you got a ton more information and ideas than any other video I've ever tried to make. So I'm going to continue this process. However, I will point out that this next video that you're about to watch is probably going to be a bit long. Um, I'm not trying to do this, but the last video took me an hour. I was expecting 20 minutes, and this video has way more slides, and I'm expecting to, to talk for three to five minutes each. So you might want to be watching this, you know, while you're doing work and use it as kind of a, a thing to listen to and just click back. Oh, we're still on this slide. Okay. And go from there. The design here is looking pretty nice and really I like the color yellow and like the color red and just to answer the question uh, 180103 is Wednesday the 3rd of January uh, 2018. If you put it in this order that you're looking at it just makes it easier for computers to read so that's that's why I wrote it that way. All right, let's get on to it. The major question that we're going to ask is, what is an intercultural historian? You'll notice that I say anthropologist, and sometimes I say historian, and sometimes I, I say as if I'm both. And really, you have to, under, you have to understand that I'm really a, an intercultural historian, and the, the concept needs to be explained a little to you first. So here we go. What makes an intercultural historian. The first thing you have to be is a historian. History is so old, it's... <laughs> I mean, it, history is the very beginning of history. The first person to start writing history was the very first point that we go, okay, this is when things began to go. Before history, we call it prehistory, and we say it, it has this totally other existence from what we have today. And so historians are these incredibly important people that we don't think about very often. Every, uh, everything in these pictures is history. Uh, the one on the left is by the Bede. It's about, or Bed, or however you pronounce his name. And he, it's about English history. Then we have one of the first historians right there in the med middle. And on the right, you have a uh, Chinese historian, Bao Zhao. Uh, <clears throat> history is basically looking at books and reading what you see there. You try to find major sources like uh, magazines or uh, journals and diaries, plus any decrees during that time or any information you can find to make a image in your mind of what was going on during this time and why things worked. There is tons of history to talk about and tons of things to uh, do. This is going to come to as a surprise to some of you, but there is more history than just World War II. Whenever I walk through the history section at any bookstore, it seems like World War II takes up most of it. Then we get into some English history, and sometimes they talk about other histories, but they're always like, but really it's English history, in case you are wondering. <laughs> and it's actually kind of annoying, because there's so much history to study. I don't care about World War II as much as I care about World War I, or... You know, the Civil War, American Civil War, was nice. Well, not... I, I was major, but that doesn't mean I particularly want to only study that. I love history. History is amazing because there's always more to learn. There's always something greater or something you didn't understand. Every time I sat down with uh, professors and I was discussing what I was studying... They'd be like, oh, well, you haven't read this book. Oh, well, that's because you didn't know about this. Or, and sometimes they weren't being very nice about it. They're like, you wrote this paper, and then you said, well, I just found out this. And you, you claim to be such and such? No, you're, you're not a historian of this. You're an idiot. <laughs> and they were right. I didn't know about that, and therefore I must be an idiot. And that's the great part about history is you must be an idiot to start it. Uh, other great parts about history is just about everything philosophically comes from history. Science is the history of that moment. We're studying, if you study chemistry, you say, well, this is the history of how these chemical reactions respond. And quite often when you're reading a uh, science book, 
it goes through, you know, the different philosophers through history as if it's in a progressive order. That's actually a history book. I actually had to do that for anthropology classes where, you know, we start off with this guy, then we go to this guy, then we see how it moves into this guy, then we see how it moves into this guy, and that is history as we understand it. And that is why historians are in generally a good idea. But intercultural history, you have to look up sources and and important uh, documents to understand how the people were thinking at that time of that culture. So then you can do a comparison between other cultures and their sources. So that's why uh, an intercultural historian is in fact a historian. This moves us on to an anthropologist. An anthropologist is a person who explains a culture to someone else. That doesn't always mean that they're smart about it. The anthropologists are notoriously dumb. And, and I don't mean that as in a mean way. That is just something you have to accept with anthropologists. Until about a hundred years ago, we didn't know we should go into the culture and live with the people. Before that, they were taking people out of the culture, interviewing them for like hours on end, and sometimes paying them off to find out information, and then pushing them back, going, oh, well, you know, I might visit once or twice, but, you know, you stay over there, I'm over here, I'm where civilization is. So it was a real big thing a hundred years ago to go into the culture and just kind of try to live with the people. And anthropology is uh, four different fields. One is skulls and uh, body, uh, body parts and stuff. The other part is linguistics. That's uh, the Rosetta Stone on the left. It's not the perfect picture. I got almost all of these pictures from Wikipedia, so you might as well know. And it and linguistics is a major part of intercultural history because I can see how a language changes depending on where you are. So if there is a word in somebody's uh, language and it's similar to another word, to a word in somebody else's culture, I know that there was probably a connection, so long as I can check. I have to go and do other checks as well. And then there's archaeology, where you go in and you look at the, the ruins, the pottery, uh, things remaining from different civilizations, and you just try to explain what these different civilizations were like through these uh, remaining things, through these ruins. And so anthropology becomes incredibly important to intercultural history because many of the people I'm studying no longer exist or the stories or information about them isn't around anymore. So it becomes important that I use anthropology. Uh, it is a lot of fun when you have a lot of cultures together. So then you can be like, well, I want to do a study on, uh, say, the Filipinos and the Samoans. Well, oh, hey, there's a Filipino and a Samoan just sitting next to each other chatting. I should just join that conversation, and hey, my study is uh, just me having a conversation with them. It's way easy that way. That's why uh, if you ever want to study intercultural history, you should go to a very highly densely cultural area. Not just one culture, but multiple, multiple cultures, because it will just make your studying a lot easier. Anthropology in and of itself, and when we tell stories of anthropology, is people who stand, sit at a fire and kind of chat with the locals there. That's why I use the uh, the Dead Souls. Oh, dang it. I forget the name of the game. But y you know the game. It's right there. But I, I just forget the name right now. But it it's a major game, and that's a actually a save point right there. But it represents what most people think of anthropology is you sitting down with a primitive culture and just kind of sitting at the fireplace, listening to them talk about their culture, which is a major thing, and I know tons of people who do this, and it's very important, so I don't want to insult it, even though my studies might be different. And I, that is anthropology in and of it. That is anthropology and why it's included in a intercultural history. It's incredibly important that somebody studies this culture so that I can look at their information and get to know the people there, and then compare it to another culture based on the anthropology from there. This one is going to look a little different. Business studies. Why on earth would business studies be important in intercultural history? Well, the reality is business studies is the study of how a business can make itself better by looking at the groups around it. There was actually an amazing bit of ethnology done to sell 
milkshakes to a particular group. It took somebody to sit down and watch people drink milkshakes, figure out why they're drinking the milkshakes, and how to improve for these people to make milkshake sales rise up. So business studies is kind of uh, an application of studies. The, other, the previous two, history and anthropology, they like, to do, they like to talk about stuff, but they don't like to do stuff. I, I don't know how to, how to say that correctly. They like theory. They don't like application. So then you get into things like uh, disruptive uh, technology and stuff and how it works within a culture. That is an incredibly important thing, but it's actually a business studies first. People are starting to look at that through history, through anthropology, through cultural things, and they're like, oh, yeah, this is important. I can't believe we haven't looked at it through this lens. Because beforehand, they were just looking at it through, well, this culture did this, and then somebody else would write, well, this culture did this, but they would never do a comparative study. So it becomes important that, you know, we have these ideas from business studies to use within intercultural history. Not to mention shipping. Shipping and movement of systems is something very business study-like. Uh, business students study this all the time. The president of my, my university was actually, that's all he studied, was how things were moved through uh, a manufacturing and then to shipping and then to uh, the place that it needed, and the entire process of that. And that is an incredibly important thing, and we don't have a lot of other people who do that kind of study. So business studies is important. In fact, I'll, I'll be honest with you, a lot of things that business studies have shown show up a lot in intercultural history. You're, you're going to see them a little later. But business studies is very important, even though it doesn't look like it should be. Technology in and of itself is important. When you look at two cultures, you have to say, okay, what were the technologies they had and how did they use them? For instance, this water wheel that you see on the right was drawn by the Chinese in a different picture and it looks very archaic because the Chinese simply didn't have a water wheel system in their culture. So they had difficulties understanding what the Europeans were talking about. In the same way, our voyagers and our uh, means of uh, communication become incredibly important. That's, a, uh, that's not a cobweb. That's actually a bunch of wires, telephone wires, going back and forth throughout a city. And they didn't, and instead of having like one wire that sends all the information through, they had multiple wires connecting to multiple places, and it was chaotic. It reminds me of uh, late 90s, early 2000s wiring jobs where just wires were everywhere and it would take black magic to understand what the heck was going on. In the same way, we have uh, a sailboat or a sail ship by Native Hawaiians and they're, it looks like they're off to war because they're wearing helmets. And <clears throat> honestly, now I'm looking and trying to see if I, I, I know that place. But it's important because that was a means of technology that helped transport the Hawaiians and the Polynesians throughout all of the Pacific. And we have to understand how that technology worked and how it worked within the culture itself. So technology is incredibly important. How does this technology move things forward? How does it change the culture? How does the culture change to the technology? And how does it change the technology itself? So technology is important to an intercultural historian. Political science. Uh, this, at first, it is an awkward subject. Um, I've got to be honest with you. I don't agree with the way political science does certain things. They look for answers. And they have, from my experience with political scientists, they're very much so about who is right and who is wrong and who has the right answers and who, who should be doing such and such. And sometimes I'm just like, eh, that doesn't really work. You're, you're not applying this really well. You're just looking for ways to be right. But there is an incredible importance for political science. Um, political scientists are the ones who go into places like Israel and Palestine and talk about the actual war going on there. Speaking of which, I'm, I'm just going to tell you the truth. 
the war you're imagining does not exist. I'll go into that later, but I want you to look at those flags and realize that those people, for the most part, actually get along. Somebody else is pushing them to it. The nationalism, the concept of nationalism is a very political science type of idea. The concept of globalization is a very political science idea. Uh, the way the politics work and how they think they have to do things uh, is a very political science thing. Um, bottom left is the Maginot Line. This was the line France made to stop Germany from invading it in World War II. They made a giant opening for Belgium because Belgium made this big political thing where they couldn't invade because the, the Maginot Line would block them from entering into France. And Belgium was like, no, we're, we're French. We're, 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 we're French-ish. We're Belgian. We're, we're good friends with you. Why are you doing this? And so the French didn't put the line there, and that's where the Germans came through, which is amazing because that's what they did the previous war. Uh, political science also studies terrorism. I took a political science class, and it was entirely about terrorism. And at the end of the class, we were supposed to make up a terrorist attack. I'm not going to ever tell you what my terrorist attack was, but uh, I did get with a group, and we pretended to kidnap somebody. And it was hilarious. Uh, well, I mean, we weren't actually going to hit, to hurt the guy, even in our plan. We 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 just we were we were pansies, frankly. But it was a, a major study, and the guy who was in charge of it was very smart about it. You know, he said, "Okay, most of the most of the uh, terrorism you think of comes from." German terrorists comes from American terrorists. They spread their ideas to the Middle East and to uh, Northern Africa. So our idealization of the way terrorists works is actually not the way it's actually set up. So we, we should view it in a very different lens. And political science is the one that looks at it that way. So really... We need to be an intercultural historian. You need to be a political scientist, though you have to be careful with that. You have to be a historian. You have to study business and business ideas. You have to study technology. You have to study the cultures directly through anthropology and writing ethnologies. You have to be willing to do a lot of extra work that others don't do. But within all of that, you get to find out how cultures interact and how they work. And so the next question you have to ask is, how, do you, how does intercultural history work? How do you do a study when you're an intercultural historian? And that leads to the next set of questions. So here we go. The bomb theory is actually a business studies idea first, and I didn't know that. I had studied uh, the Vietnam War in a history class, and it was entirely us just sitting down and reading sources. And halfway through the class, I was actually having nightmares because I was reading about these horrific things. And they were they were very over the top about the gruesomeness and the lethality of this war. And I, I just had nightmares. So when I was reading it, I realized that there was this, this idea or concept within everything we were taught where the war itself was like a bomb. Just imagine a giant explosion happened. And the people directly hit by the explosion, right where the explosion happened, were killed or were hurt greatly. And then you move a little bit further, and there, there were people who were hurt, but they'll survive. And then you move a little bit further, and there's people who are affected by it because they hurt it or they had their windows shattered, but they're fine. And then you have people way out who aren't affected by it at all and don't even know the explosion happened. And that's where the bomb theory is. As you move closer to the center, you are more affected by something. Or as you move away from the where the explosion happened, you are it's how unaffected you are. It turns out this was a business theory, uh, which is why I, I made sure to show you business studies, where, you know, what, what is our uh, clientele? What should our clientele be like? Who are connecting groups to it? And how will, you know, them doing this affect people around them? And who will be affected? Within bomb theory for intercultural history, you can say, like, okay, how did the Vietnam War affect people? The first thing you have is the people who are directly 
in the war, and that is the people of Vietnam, the Vietnamese, who, you know, they're being bombed, they're being destroyed, there's two factions trying to destroy them, and they're just trying to live their lives. And so they are affected directly by this Vietnam War. Then you have the sides. You have the North Vietnamese side, and you have the South, and you have the South Vietnamese side. And they're fighting each other. And what's really interesting is, beforehand, these people were simple citizens. They were simple Viet Vietnamese. But as soon as they chose a side, they started to move away from the explosion a little. And it's weird, because I, I read diaries of famous, or not famous, but of North Vietnamese uh, soldiers. There was a nurse. And she viewed the people of, you know, who supported South Vietnam as, as vermin. You know, she didn't care if they died. She had no problems killing them. And yet she was a nurse. And when somebody attacked, you know, a North Vietnamese side, she felt strongly that this was a horrible, evil thing and that the Vietnamese people should not stand for this. But if somebody supporting the other side did it, she would be like, eh, they deserved it. They're supporting the wrong guys. And then we'd have American soldiers who are on the South Vietnamese side and they're directly affected. And, you know, we have nurses, we have all these people and they have the explosions happening to them and they're being affected by it but not as directly as somebody who's actually living there. And then you have their family members who are hearing these stories, you know, through the news and through all these things. But their family members, they they basically heard the explosion, but they're nowhere near it. You know, their, their windows are being shattered, but they're not being affected. And they've all grown these opinions on how the Vietnam War should go. And we were kind of shocked when we found that most of those opinions had nothing to do with the war itself. It was just two sides in, in the U.S. who wanted, you know, to have this disagreement and wanted to say these things. But really, they, they weren't going to look at the war itself, which was way duller than it was being talked about. That, that was another thing we had to study was, you know, people were living their lives in this war. The, the people directly affected by the bomb continued living their lives. They had kids. They had, they had to grow food. They had to go to work. They lived their lives. They didn't stop. And for some odd reason, we don't imagine that when we imagine war. People just going about their lives. I hate watching movies where they're like, and then they just sat there stranded for three years. And I'm like, they would have starved. They had to just go on with their lives. Sometime. I'd hate to tell you this. But they had to continue living for them to suffer. And that, that's a weird thing for people to understand. So the bomb theory is us understanding an uh, an event and how it affects people. And what's really interesting is the bomb theory helps us understand things from a very different point of view. For instance, if you looked at a map, India and England are nowhere near each other and we wouldn't, you know, even think about it. But if you looked at a bomb theory, you would be like, no, India and England have directly affected each other. England ran India for a hundred years. We should say that England and India are a lot closer than England and Germany are. Because Germany, because England did not affect Germany as much as England affected uh, India. It's a weird thing to think about. Now, Germany affecting England? Oh, yeah, that happened a lot. I mean, English history is basically, and then the Germans invaded. So, you know, that's, that's something you have to think about. But you have to just see the events and how they work within the bomb theory, and it really helps out with the, your understanding of uh, intercultural history and how it works. Domination theory is a study of how one culture dominates another. And I, I don't know how to say this. Most of the theories you're going to look at, I came up with on my own and found out others were working on it later. So I'm giving you the name I use, but you're probably going to find it in other terms. I hear sociology has a domination theory, but I haven't looked at it directly. So you should know that. But domination theory is the concept in our minds of, you know, this group is dominant over this group, and why? And there's this cycle that goes on. So it's also called domination cycle, where at one point, this group might not even be considered important in history. And then a couple, a century later, it is the most important thing in the entire history of the world. And they will change the way the history works and the way everything views it. Uh, case in point, China in the 1950s and 
early 20th century was not considered important. Even into the 1960s, it wasn't considered important. But as Chinese began to immigrate into the U.S., or again, there began to be kind of this idea that the Chinese had this importance and that they weren't less than useful, or less they weren't useless. Um, you can see this in movies like The Sand Pebbles, where the Chinese were basically just kind of wimps that could attack you with large numbers. Whereas a couple years later, after some uh, dealings with China, we're suddenly believing that all Chinese can fight each other with, you know, super cool uh, kung fu. And then a little while later, when they start manufacturing, when we say something that was made in China, we said it was, you know, lower quality and not as important, and you just don't buy it unless you, unless you absolutely have to. And today, the phone I'm using right now is actually made in China. <laughs> Uh, designed by Chinese who aren't from China. China actually has a different idea of what China is. Or the Chinese don't view China as a country, as more as a culture. And you have to understand that. But domination theory is this concept of somebody going from nobody to important within a culture. Or how you know somebody can be so important at one point and just loses everything. Through, uh, through anything else. And the major thing you have to look at is how disruptive technology or disruptive I ideology works. You know, because this group is considered unimportant, they can start moving into fields and everybody's like, well, it doesn't matter. They're not important. You know, we, we still, the, the major guys still control the field. So why should we care that, you know, uh, these computer geeks are making this weird interconnected thing that they call the internet. It, it's unimportant. It, it's not going to affect manufacturing or any jobs at retail whatsoever. And that's the reason why uh, people, why domination theory is important is we can take that same concept and say, well, do you realize that European settlers in the U.S. and in the Americas were considered lower quality people and most of the native tribes owned them. I mean, in some cases, directly owned them. And in some case, and in most cases, they simply, if they didn't like a group, they would just wipe them out. They would just go in and wipe them out. The Virginia colonies was basically year in, year out. The only reason they survived was immigration. Just immigration after immigration after immigration. It, that was the only way they survived. The, the Indians there, the Native Americans there, were in charge, and they held their power. The same thing with the Comanche or any other tribe. They held power. But as they squabbled in between each other, uh, the different tribes, they would lose an area and lose an area and lose an area just because the war happened. And the settlers would move into those areas and then start you know, building forts and building uh, what they considered uh, civilization over there. So that's pretty much what domination theory shows is the European settlers did not come in with guns ablazing and win. Their guns didn't work. And the guns they did have, the Native Americans bought or stole and used to dominate continuously over the other people. Our concept of being dominant the entire time comes from late 19th century where there was sort of this peaceful moment and everybody just looked around and went, wait, when did we take over the world? And how? When did this happen? And just... They rebuilt this uh, narrative from, okay, the, the natives are the important group and we're unimportant to, no, we are the important ones and we've always been the important ones. And you see that even today where people are like, oh yeah, we've, we've totally dominated the Native Americans this entire time. And I'm like, no. <laughs> In every major battle, you lost. In every major political thing, the only way you won is if they were losing anyway from someone else. But that that's domination theory... In a, in a nutshell, it, it takes a lot to explain, and I'll be brutally honest with you. Uh, usually when I talk about it, I have people who look at me and kind of hate my guts for talking about it, because it directly goes against the narrative they've grown up with. And this is something you have to realize is domination theory isn't just, you know, how does this dominant group view itself, but how does the dominated group view itself and why? And that will kind of affect the way you think, because you have to realize there are groups out there who truly believe that they are being dominated and that they deserve it for some reason. So you have to think about it in that way. 
domination theory is an important part of intercultural history because you'll see the cultures dominating and uh, being dominated by each other over and over again, and you have to have an explanation for it. Now we're getting into the way civilization works. Walls and rules are a concept of how we view civilization today. It's basically a system of walls and rules. You, The first real example is by a guy named Hammurabi. He was... I was about to say Mesoamerican. <laughs> no, he was a, a Middle Eastern ruler, 3000 BC, and he wrote, he took all the rules of his country and wrote them on the walls. So if somebody had a question about what the rules were, they could go to the wall and be like, there it is. And they could check. And that's an incredibly important example of walls and rules. If you go into Middle Eastern archaeology, you'll find that the walls are the most well-maintained part of the entire city. And there's a reason why. Any type of invader would have to be fought off, and the wall would protect them. And we're not talking about invaders, you know, on horses, and it's just the invaders. No, no. Uh, most people at one point were letting wild animals into a city and letting the wild animals kill everybody and eat everybody, and then they would take the city. And then the invaders would, you know, take these nice placated fed animals and shoo them out and take the city. So the walls were important. They kept out wild animals. These wild animals were actually being used as weapons. Uh, it's, <clears throat> it's one of the reasons why in Judaism you'll read about don't use, don't have anything to do with pigs. Because pigs, wild pigs, were used as weapons. And once you accept that, you're like, oh yeah, I, I, you know, that, that's a sign of peace. In these pictures, you see the Great Wall of China, which kept the Chinese, a very walls and rules type people, a very walls and rules culture, from northern invaders. And the system wasn't designed to show, to stop the invaders. It was a way to warn everybody else. So if they saw an invader come over the wall, they would light a torch on one of those little stands there, and then everybody else along the wall would see it, and they would know exactly where it happened and why and who did it, and they could create a, uh, a way to respond very quickly. Uh, the Chinese culture is probably the kind of the tetsi flies for walls and rules. There's just so much history about China that is written and documented and shown that we can just go, okay, well, how would a wall ruler respond to this? And we can be like, well, this is how the Chinese responded. Let's see what the others did. And usually it's, it's very similar. Another example is Rome. And by the way, these walls and rules, they may not actually exist. The, the wall may not, act, may not actually be there. For instance, Rome had a wall blocking them from German invaders. Really, that wall didn't exist entirely. Like, there were walls, but they weren't around the entire Roman uh, area. It was just this area over here, and this area over here, and this area over here. And then they'd have these large gates, and you had to have a uh, special uh, punch thing, uh, a special seal, and you couldn't, you know, copy this seal. You had to have an authentic seal to uh, go past the wall and go into Rome. And the Germans, you know, they were these vagrants, and they were, they were these weirdos, and the Romans were actually quite scared of them, honestly, because the Germans were like, no, we will not become you. We are going to become ourselves. And the Romans were just like, fine, we're going to build a wall. And we're going to make rules for everybody within our place, but not, but not you. Though we are going to try to dominate you and talk about our great wars against you. Even though none of those wars would make sense if you look at it from a, a different point of view. But walls and rules are basically how our civilization runs. Go ahead, look at any map, any map you want, and you'll notice we have these lines on the sand or lines on these maps that say, okay, this is, you know, Idaho, and this is Montana. And what is the difference between Idaho and Montana? Uh, the Montanans tend to show their craziness off a little bit more than Idahoans. But if you were to be honest, you know, where I live right now, Spokane, Washington, is very Idahoan. A much more Idahoan than 
somebody in Yakima or Ellensburg. So these walls and rules are a system of saying, okay, well, you're from such and such, and you must be such and such. And, you know, if you want to fit in with this culture, you have to follow these rules, or you have to fit these stereotypes. And even if you are from that culture, and you're naturally from that culture, you know, you grew up around it and all that, you will kind of feel this kind of uh, pressure to act as the stereotype, even though it's, it's nothing like your culture. I've felt it uh, as a German uh, as a German American, I felt a lot of you know pressure to be kind of angry and mad and yell a lot and uh, click my heels. Honestly, <laughs> I didn't know how Germans greeted each other because I, Germans greet each other by hugs and you know just nice conversation. But nobody outside of German culture knows this. Apparently, it's weird. It's actually very awkward. But that's that's a thing you have to uh, see within walls and rules. The culture that is very walls and rules will make, you know, lines and rules and make, make places where you have to be. And this is how you're supposed to act. And this is, and you're supposed to accept it because the walls and rules keep our society going. Uh, go ahead, look at any culture you want and say, and check to see the walls and rules within it. And you'll be kind of amazed like, wow, you know, there, there's nothing stopping anybody from doing this. Which brings us to the next uh, subject. The other civilization is the exact opposite of walls and rules. They have wall, they have rules, but the concept of walls don't make any sense. On the left, you have a Maori uh, design, of Maori carving, and on the right, you'll see the uh, Mongol Empire and the movement that you see within the Mongol Empire. The thing you haven't realized is that also represents all the trade that went over uh, the northern Eurasian continent. They, they went all the way to Germany and just thought it was really boring there and came back because there, was no, there wasn't anything interesting to trade there. They could get whatever they wanted in other places. So they went as far as Baghdad and Georgia and Korea and they just were able to open up trade and say the Mongols rule the trade. The other civilization is about movement and trade. <clears throat> and that is an incredibly important thing. And the other civilization is called this because it's often groups that we consider the other. You know, they're, they're not civilized. They're, they're this other group. They don't have history. History is written by walls and rules. And they, they pass all their history down by memorizing songs and and other things like that. That that that's not history. They they don't have history. They they're not civilized. So we call it the other civilization, even though they're incredibly important. As you can see, Korea all the way to Russia is an incredibly large and important group. And if you look, they they take over. I mean, a large swath of Eurasia. And if you look before the Mongolian Empire, you'll see that that was the trade. That was the trade route they used anyway. So <clears throat> this other civilization is important, but it's difficult to study because you can't look at it in the same way that uh, normal historians have to look through it. You have to use anthropology and other methods to find things out. And I'm, I'm going to talk about them uh, pretty soon as well. So the other civilization is kind of the opposite of uh, walls and rules. And there's there's concepts of where they're in between each other. And, and the in interesting thing you should really know about the other civilization is they can be within a place that is run by walls and rules. In the same way you have people who are downloading that video game and talking to each other on the internet and couldn't care less about the world around them. They are caught up in this globalized structure where they're talking to each other all over the world and frankly looking like the other civilization but the uh, walls and rules around them look very different are saying, you can't download this, you can't do this, you can't do this. How dare you go to the website? Don't you know they're evil there? And the other civilization on the internet is just going, yeah, I'm going to that website anyway. <laughs> you made a line on the internet. You made a wall on the internet. What? That makes no sense. It's, it's a simple address. I can just go there on my own. Why would I even pay attention to you? 
And that's uh, the other civilization and how it's kind of becoming a modern and important thing to us because we're calling it globalization, but it is in fact older than we think it is, way older. Stalin's divide is an, is an interesting thing and there's kind of two parts to it. So the first part is Stalin's divide and it's named after Joseph Stalin, the guy in the middle. By the way, uh, one of the guys in this picture will disappear in later pictures because he, he insulted Stalin somehow. And so they removed him, both from the picture and from life. Uh, <clears throat> the interesting things you have to note or notice about Stalin's divide is during the time of Joseph Stalin, he would look at these, these uh, civilizations, these groups, these cultures, and he would have them fight each other for more rations or for praise from him. Because praise from him meant, you know, you, you were safe, you were okay. And, you know, being scolded by him might mean you will starve to death. He had no problems with starving the Ukrainian people to death. Uh, the Ukrainians are still working to overcome this, and it's, it's a very sore subject with them to this day. So Stalin will go in, and he'll, even if the people get along and there's actually no difference in the culture, They're, the culture isn't divided, it's the same culture, he will find a difference between them and he'll, you know, start praising one for one thing and start praising the other for another thing and just start turning them into these other cultures or these two separate cultures and start having them fight each other so that he can gain uh, things from them. The interesting thing about Stalin's divide is we do it all the time and we don't realize it. When you talk about wars or uh, people who hate each other, you always think, oh, well, they've always been divided. They, they've never gotten along. But the truth is, the French and the Germans have been right next to each other this entire time. And yes, they've had wars with each other. And they've had people crossing that border back and forth for centuries. They never viewed each other as different. They just had a different language. And in our minds, we've created kind of this wall because somebody said, well, they've always been at war. And the same way the English and the French have never gotten along, even though there's people who are English with French names, and that French name comes from like 13th century uh, immigration from France. Is that person French or is he English? And the answer is, well, yes, both. He is he's raised in England, but, is descendant, but he uh, descends from French, and he is both. So why do we make this divide? Because in our minds, we have created this wall between them. And that is what Stalin used to kind of overpower and control people. Which brings us to the Pokemon of War. The Pokemon of War is you've created this kind of difference in your mind of these people. And you say, okay, well, now they're fighting each other. And that's how you view them. Uh, we have... News people will talk about, you know, the differences and of how things happen. And actually, this is very important for the Pokemon of War is a lot of concepts of sports became nationalized as a way to promote sports. And that means that they would use uh, not religious, but they would make sort of a religious feeling to the sport itself. Like, oh, I, when I was at a soccer game, they actually had this moment where you know, they had everybody stand up and show their flags of, you know, this particular team. And they announced each name and everybody had to just, you know, sing that person's name out because it would be on this big board and they'd be like, who is this? Oh, that's Mo Fat, who, by the way, turned out to be a terrible player. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, <laughs> but he was our team and this was important because this is our side. And that's the Pokemon of War, where you fight, watch somebody else fight, and you've chosen a side. And it's difficult for you to imagine that they might actually get along. The Stalin's Divide is in your mind, and you're now kind of choosing a side. In the same way of Pokemon, you could choose any random character, but once you throw them down and you say, that's my, that's my uh, Pokemon, you kind of own that Pokemon. You, you view that Pokemon in a very different way than any other random Pokemon. So your Pikachu is more important to you than that Pidgey. That doesn't make a lot of sense to you until you, you know, you watch news and, you know, the news is like, well, as you know, 
such and such says such and such, but by our evidence, it shows such and such. And so you're kind of using the news to give you information about a conflict that may not actually be around. Uh, World War I, you probably don't realize this, but the English, the French, and the German soldiers who were fighting each other got along. It took about a year for them to actually fight each other. They were in trenches, pointing guns at each other, but they weren't fighting. They would fire these weapons and all that stuff, but they would always make sure to aim away from each other or have designated spots to hit, and they would actually trade mail with each other and have these conversations. And that's where Joyeux Noël comes from. It's, it's from the people in the trenches actually getting along. The generals themselves, the, the patriotic people of France, the patriotic people of England and Germany and others, of Prussia, sorry, Prussia, uh, they made up this idea that this conflict was a major conflict and it had to win, or it had to end with a win because that was truly what we needed. And the same way you would watch a sports game and you'd be like, oh, yeah, the Bulls won. Yeah, that's what the other team deserves. The, the same thing happened in World War I. The people themselves get along, but we want them to be divided in our minds. So it's difficult for us to imagine them as... Uh, it's difficult for us to end this Stalin's divide. And because we're be being given information... We have four or five things that, you know, this is why my side should win. And it doesn't matter what the subject is. We always have like four or five things where we say, okay, this is why my side should win for this subject. This is the four or five things why my side should win for this subject. And it doesn't matter what the subject is. You'll always find two sides and you chose one of those sides, even if they get along. I'll give you an example. Um, this is going to be hard for you to hear, but the Palestinians and the Israelis did have a war in the 1980s. It was a major war. There were bombings all the time. There were terrible things. But by all uh, recognition, by anybody who has gone into those areas, the Palestinians and the Israelis actually have stopped hating each other. There have been walls built to stop uh, bombings and stuff, but they've let Palestinians in. To be honest with you, Palestine is not what you think it is. It's a major farmland. And the people are fighting over, you know, this nice farmland that everybody kind of wants because, frankly, it's a desert and a nice, good place to farm is kind of important. But that's not the reason why they're fighting. Outside groups like Syria and Lebanon want the Palestinians to fight because if the Palestinians fight, it means that the Syrians and the Lebanese and, and Egyptians don't have to fight. They can just give guns to the Palestinians and tell them to bomb stuff and they don't have to fight, and they can claim all this major things. In the same way, World War I had people patriotically declaring that, you know, their side was going to win. <clears throat> we have the same thing in Israel. It's, in Israel, we have people who want the end of the world, and, and I, I don't know how to say that correctly, who want the Battle of Megiddo and all that stuff. And so they, they tell the people, you know, you've got to fight. You know, we'll give you bombs and weapons. We'll, we'll help you fight. I think the most uh, interesting example is when President Clinton was trying to unite the Palestinians and uh, Israelis, and every time he talked about it, he talked as if they were two different sides, and that they had all this conflict, and at no point did they go, actually, you're the same people, and you're, you're starting to get along. And because of that, you know, in the U.S., we'll find people who religiously or otherwise believe honestly believe that Israel needs to win so that, you know, Christ can come. And just so that you know, there's a similar belief in uh, the Muslim uh, Quran. And so they, they believe the same thing and they promote the same idea that, you know, the Palestinians must win because, you know, this would be a great victory for uh, Muslim kind. So it is this war where the people are getting along, but everybody outside of them wants them to continue to fight. And that is the Pokemon of war. Finally, we're going to have to talk about a subject uh, within intercultural history that historians and anthropologists and others know, but it's difficult to explain to non-others. <laughs> I don't know how to say this correctly. Uh, 
the way you view history is great men made great decisions and great things happened because of it. Whether they were good or evil, they were great men. And they were always intelligent and doing things, you know, perfectly, and they knew what they were doing. This is uh, the guy in Around the World in 80 Days. You know, he never made a mistake. He always knew what he was doing. He was, he was super intelligent. He was super smart. And when you look into history, you'll find out that that's not how it works. We're usually moving forward by idiots, lunatics, and crooks. And my example here is from uh, aeronautical history. The first major balloonists, they were called aeronauts, were kind of crazy. They all knew that hot air, or all the scientists knew that it was hot air that made the balloon rise. But the first guy to get a balloon to rise and prove it didn't actually know about the hot air. He thought it was the smell. He was a crazy farmer. Then the first guy to get into a balloon actually had to fight for the right to do this because nobody knew if it was safe. And they were going to put prisoners into the balloon. And he was like, no, I want to get into this. So he had to be an idiot or a lunatic to get into this thing. And a lunatic is somebody, an idiot is somebody who does something great but doesn't understand what he's doing or the dangers involved. He just, he just does it. A lunatic is somebody who fully understands that there are dangers and does it anyway. This is Chuck Yeager, one of the greatest test pilots in history. He His job was to get into an airplane and try to make it crash, and then hope that his skills could get it to uncrash before he hit the ground. He got into ships that they were only sort of prototypes, and they didn't know if they worked, and he had to fly it into the air and see what the problems were. And he would do inc incredibly insane things, like, you know barrel rolls and other stuff as hard as he could to get it kind of to not work right. Chuck Yeager was a lunatic. And if you ever, you know, met him and asked him for stories, he would tell stories and he'd be like, what kind of crazy guy would do this? And, you know, you'd be right. It would be, it, it would be a good question. But without doing that, we wouldn't have moved forward with how aeroplanes and jet engines work. Chuck Yeager moved us forward by knowing that there was a danger and doing it anyway. <clears throat> the next thing is the sky car, or crooks. The sky car was this brilliant idea. Uh, I believe the guy's name was Moeller. He had this idea on how the car should work and what the way it should move and, and the ways that it would be useful and he really promoted this idea, and he's been given hundreds of millions of dollars to build one, and he's never quite done it. People are starting to question whether or not he's actually built one, or if he just took the money. And, you know, that's that's up to a debate, and I'm, I'm not going to get into it. What I am going to say is that because of him, he's inspired others to mail, to make flying cars. Many of the flying cars we have kind of look or act the same as the famous sky car because that's what they were looking at. Much of the time in history, you couldn't do something because smart, intelligent people are incredibly safe. They don't want to move forward because of the dangers. They're not idiots, they're not lunatics, and they're most definitely not crooks. So, they, so you can't move forward. Because of that, you know, if you want to do something you have to be willing to do something crazy. You have to be doing something kind of stupid. And oftentimes you have to get your money from a, a less than desirable source. I, I don't know how to say that correctly. Uh, the mob, basically. Uh, it shows up in video games all the time. Is where, where did you get the money? Best not find out, best not ask that question. Uh, how did you move forward? Well, we were kind of idiots and lunatics. I mean, let's describe the guys who made Doom. Uh, when John Romero described the way a caco demon uh, collapsed, he didn't do it by, you know, okay, I want blood here and blood here. He did it by sound effects and uh, hand gestures. He was like, and go ahead. Just watch a caco demon from Doom uh, fall apart and just imagine John Romero, you know, describing it with his sound effects. And you're, you, you can almost hear his voice at that moment. And that's what you need, because he was crazy, but he was willing to do the work, so he made Doom. And that's kind of what we have to think about. Uh, I, I really don't know how to say this, but Columbus 
did not get money from Spain. He got it from the mob. And the mob said, okay, we'll give you this funding so long as you follow these parameters and so long as you can pay it back. And he said, fine. And then he went to Spain and he said, okay, I'd like to use your ships. And Spain gave them some crappy ships and a really crappy crew. And then they added provisos that said, you know, if you don't find the Eastern Indies, or the, uh, not East Indies, it was actually called Hindustan or uh, this other group, you cannot claim that as your own and you can't make any money. And so, you know, he got on his boat, you know, in debt for, with the mob, having people, you know, lying straight to him, and he was willing to do it. He was the only willing, he was the only person willing to move west when everybody knew that the world was round. That's something you have to accept, is that he had to be crazy, he had to be a bit of a lunatic, and he had to work with crooks to find the Americas. And even then, he couldn't actually claim it was the Americas, because then he'd lose money, and he owed money to the mob. In the end, he uh, died in debtor's prison, so... That's, that's kind of how history works. We have these idiots, lunatics, and crooks, and then we kind, of, we kind of get rid of all the bad stories and make up stories that sound good, and then we say, oh, yes, he was a great man, he made a great decision, and he knew what he was doing, and, oh, we are so thankful for him. But when you look into the history, you're like, no, he was an idiot. He, he had to be crazy, and he worked with crooks, and we owe him a lot. So that's kind of an important thing within intercultural history. You don't look for the great men. You look for the idiots, the lunatics, and the crooks. Okay, you ought to go take a tea, uh, pee break or something, because honestly, I'm at 56 minutes, and I'm about halfway through. So, you know, hit pause, go on, it's cool, I understand. But, you know, once you come back, I'll, I'll start over, or I'll start. Okay, so, you know, you've, you've seen, you know, the different theories and different ideas that uh, intercultural historians have to use. We have to use idiots, lunatics, and crooks to understand things. We have to look at it through a technological point of view. We have to look at it, you know, from the walls and rules of how this culture of this civilization works, as opposed to the other civilization, which works very differently, and how they uh, connected to each other and how they worked with each other and against each other. And also, you know, what it's like to be an anthropologist and a historian and a business student and technological stuff, all all of that, you know, is needed to become an intercultural historian and an intercultural uh, theorist. So now we have to go into what other methodologies are used. What methodologies do you need to use when you're doing intercultural history that other people probably don't use? And that's what this subject is about. Names. <laughs> you're probably thinking, names? Why is names important? But this really did happen. I was in a, I was giving a lecture for a communications class, and I just asked, okay, what are your names? Okay, this is the history of your name. You know, this is what it means. This is about the point of history when it came to be. So your name is so many centuries long, and you're very likely from this area of the world. And they just sat there going, wow, my name has that much history? And the answer is yes, it totally has that much history. Speaking of which, my full last name is Borkholthaus. No wonder I go by Keith Haas. I wonder why. But uh, in the picture on the left, you will actually see a Borkholthaus. It is a, uh, by my cousin Jeff's point of view, it is the point between a castle, the woods, and kind of a clearing right there. So if you'll look, there's kind of a clearing between Nomsvanda Castle and those woods, and that is the Borkholthaus. Or the entire castle itself is a Borkholt house. And you know what? I'm going to go with Borkholt. The Nonschwander castle is a uh, Borkholt house in and of itself. Because, hey, it, it's a lot more fun. And, you know, there's a lot more to it. Then, you know, this alleyway is my name right there. Woo! But the history of names kind of shows the history. For instance, the way the first uh, word in my name is spelt with an O instead of an E, which means that it's an older German name. Uh, in the same way that when you look at genealogy of names and ideas, you can see kind of how the name changes from Giuseppe to Joseph to Yassif to uh, Jasif, and, you know, all the way throughout history and all the way from Western society to Eastern society and how it changes. Or if it 
if it actually shows up at all. And that's what uh, a name is important. You know, you can look through names and you can just kind of feel this history. Okay, this person during this time had this name. And you can just kind of get this history lesson. So long as you know history, enough history about those areas, you can just kind of see this person and how they lived and the way they did things just by looking at a name and some information about them. We also look for nonverbal connections. Uh, this is going to be kind of weird for you, but if you look in the center, that is a uh, Filipina. She's uh, showing off that she's talking about chicken adobo, which is a very Filipino dish, and she's pointing with her lips, which doesn't mean a lot to you until you realize that there's a Nigerian group, or there's a Nigerian tribe that points with their lips, and most Native American tribes throughout North and South America point with their lips. And if you follow the Filipinos all the way into uh, Vietnam and, uh, I was about to say Maori, um, I forget the name. But, you know, you'll find Southeast Asians that point with their lips. And then throughout the Pacific, you will find people who may point with their lips or may point with their face and their lips kind of point, pucker a little. But not as hard as, say, that Navajo over there. And you just kind of find this connection. And you go, okay we have a possible connection. We don't know how it works or why, but we can say that there is a possible connection. Look, see, she's pointing with her lips, he's pointing with her lips, she's pointing with her lips, so maybe there's a connection. And then you look for other things, and that's when you find something like potatoes in South America can be found all the way in New Zealand, because there was trade between the Polynesians and the Pacific Islanders, both between the Southeast Asians and uh, South America, and very likely there were colonies in South America. Then you look at the Nigerian tribe, and you can see that there was a major trade area during that during a certain kind of point of time, and they were actually sending boats out. So very likely there was groups going to the Americas and bringing people back and sending people in that we've simply forgotten about. And this one tribe in Northern Africa, or in uh, the Niger River area, is, you know, a remnant of that. We don't know much more information, but it's a sign. You just have to look for more after that. So, nonverbal connections becomes important that way. Traditions. Way off on the left, you will see, you know, a drum, a man pat pounding, in Germany, that is a lithograph of uh, a shaman in German culture doing something. In the center, you see a Mongolian with a drum singing a song and doing a ceremony <coughs> with many of the same traditions that you see on the left. And then way on the right, although not in picture, you can find a shaman in Korea who does the same thing. So you know that there is some kind of cultural connections, very likely through the other civilization, between Germany and all the way to Korea. That is huge. That is the Eurasian continent right there. Think about how much information was being passed back and forth between these groups that nobody ever realized. And the only way we know about it is through traditions. I became aware of it when somebody showed me a uh, gut, which is a ceremony of somebody becoming a shaman in Korean culture, and they started talking about, you know, some of the things that happened within it. And I was really shocked because some of these beliefs were showing up in my German culture when my sister was dying in a hospital. Uh, before you get all sad, she actually got better. Uh, <laughs> but we were expecting her to die, to die, and we were just like, oh, you know, she's she's seen spirits. Oh, she's she's understanding, you know, things by the way she's uh, going through these things. She has, and when she recovered and she, she had difficulties um, keeping her mind straight because frankly she was going through this horrific thing, uh, we associated it with spirits and with other things that these shamans were all talking about. And I realized that this German cultural thing was actually being spread, you know, both through all the shamans of... Mongolia and into North or into Korea also into Vietnam which means that they also came through China and possibly even India that is huge that is a huge connection and if you just look at the traditions and the way people do things 
you can find these connections and try to understand how they moved and how they how they thought that doesn't mean that they always had connections but that there is a way to kind of find things through that so that's one of the methodologies that uh, intercultural historians use that others don't i couldn't think of a way to show you natives i'm sorry but a native is somebody who was born and raised in a culture and if you ask them a question, they'll be able to give you an answer. Uh, when I was doing my studies on pointing lips between Native Americans and uh, Southeast Asians, I was like, okay, I've got to find some other connections. And I found the potato thing, but I was just like, okay, maybe, maybe they have these beliefs. Maybe they have these. So I sat down with an old roommate of mine who was uh, Oneida, Oneida, and I asked him, okay, you know, what about this? What about this? And he's like, you know, none of that works. How would you look at, you know, the, the creation story and how that worked? Because we have a very similar creation story throughout most of North America. And I was like, oh, okay. And uh, I'll tell you some of the story was, you know, this magical animal found some mud on the ground or in this water. And he just kept on pulling it up until he created the world. And the same thing happens for uh, the stories of Maui. He fished out islands. And then you can find stories like that within uh, that Nigerian tribes where, you know, they crossed waters and then they crossed waters. But before there was land, they had to pull it out from the mud. And that's how land was created. So there's there's this connection, very loose. But because we have so much uh, evidence showing and showing and showing, we can say, yeah, there was a connection. There was definitely a connection. So we use natives because natives will know the connections better than the non-natives. So it becomes incredibly important. Now that we understand intercultural historians and how they work, some of the methodologies they use, you're probably asking yourself, what is a native video gamer? You, you've got it on the name of your YouTube channel, but you, you haven't explained this to us. And so I'm going to answer those questions right now with uh, these slides. So here we go. I'm going to tell you something about intercultural history that is actually very difficult. When I tell you that, you know, that shaman on the left has similar cultural beliefs as that shaman on the right, even though they're thousands of miles apart from each other, you would probably agree with me. You'd be like, oh, that's cool. But then if I told you, you know, finding out any information past that point is very difficult, you would, you would, under, you, I would have to explain. In any civilized walls and rules type place, we write history about them. We say, this was the history of these people. This is what they did. This is how they did it. And, you know, we would write the history in a very specific way because that's what historians write. But if you get to uh, North Korea or Korea or the shamans in Mongolia, we were not going to send historians there. We're going to send anthropologists we're going to tell those anthropologists to write an ethnology or a writing about their culture. And this writing will be very different from the history that was written for the Germanic peoples, uh, modern Germanic people. And you have to be like, oh man, how do, how do I do this comparison when, you know, I'm being given different information. I read an ethnology about a shaman in Korea and it was great, but it was about how you felt when you were a shaman. And why did this ceremony work? And how do you feel about this? You know, very emotional, very, you know, kind of, I don't know how to politely say this, uh, looking at the foreign person and being like, oh, the foreign person believes foreign beliefs. Ha <laughs> ha. And that, that's, an, that's the thing you have to realize is the other civilization is called the other civilization because of uh, the foreignness. So we get this entire problem where I can't do a direct study because I can't find direct uh, historical knowledge or I can't find ethnological uh, knowledge about ancient Germanic or about Germanic peoples. And I can't find a lot of good history on uh, Korean shamans. I've asked professors about it, professors who were in charge of, you know, history of Korea or history of Germany, and they couldn't give me very good connections. And I was getting pretty desperate, honestly. <clears throat> so you have to see this kind of difficulty of studying. But there are answers. The first part you have to understand is the Mongolians and the Koreans are considered the other. They are 
because they are different from the way walls and rules and civilization that we imagine work, we do not consider them civilized. We do not look at them and say, well, these people, you know, have a history, they have beliefs, they have peoples, and we don't give them those things. Uh, interesting example in the uh, previous slide, there are ethnologies on people who try to study the old Germanic ways, but it's viewed in a religious way, and they are there. All those ethnologies is about the people trying to reinterpret these ideas and do them into modern times, and so I miss out on all the information I need. Honestly, I think those religious people would like, you know, the other information to come out a lot more because it would help them. And frankly, it would help my studies a lot more uh, just as well. But we have to understand that the other is this other civilization, this other concept, and they're treated in a very foreign way. The explanation by many anthropologists were the reason why these foreign people are doing these foreign things is they are foreign. This foreignness becomes the emphasis instead of the explanation. And you, you it does get annoying, but it does help when you're studying. Native anthropology is a very modern thing. It came out in the, I believe, the 90s, where a bunch of professors were looking around in their uh, offices and stuff, and or in their lecture halls, and going, why do we have nothing but white people? Why are there white people? We're, or not why are there white people, but why are there only white people, or uh, mostly white people? When you're in an uh, island in the Pacific. You're expecting to see a lot of Pacific Islanders, and instead you see mostly white people. And when they asked, you know, the Hawaiians, the Samoans, the, the Polynesians, the Melanesians, and the other groups, you know, why aren't you coming? Their response was, well, it's not for us. It's, it's, it's about us, but it's not for us. And so these professors all got together and they said, okay, we're going to write anthropology from a native's point of view. How would a native study his own culture. And uh, my professor uh, back at BYU Hawaii was a native anthropologist of uh, Polynesian culture. He was native because he happens to be Tongan. But he went and he got his uh, degree at the University of Washington. He did all these things to prove that he was a doctor and that he was very educated on the matter. But he could point at it from a point of view of a native. And a native who looks at it will not look at it with a kind of foreign view. He will say, no, this is, this is perfectly ordinary. This is a common thing. And it takes away the foreignness of the subject. That doesn't mean outsiders aren't needed. The outside point of view of going, hey, why do you do that? Will actually be something that the natives may not even recognize. For example, talking to a Navajo on why he's pointing with his lips, you know, it, it would be rude to point with your finger. Well, why? I don't know. And so this conversation between the native and the non-native is very needed. But the concept of a native studying his own culture became this incredibly important thing. And I, I'm sorry, I don't have uh, any pictures to really show that to you because they weren't just hanging out in a fire. They were just going to their family members and their friends and going like, okay, have you noticed that we do this? Why do we do that? Or, oh, hey, I'm going to go do this ceremony. Do you, do you mind if I write some... Uh, some notes while we do it, and usually the people are like, yeah, go for it. So that's a, a very different perspective and a very native perspective. Because of this, we can start having native anthropology of the common German peoples and their common German beliefs. So then we can have an ethnology that I can use as a comparison for German beliefs with Korean beliefs. And I can do that comparison. Or then we can do a, a history of modern society and how it works. We only look for the foreign, and we always make it sound foreign. And with native anthropology, we can take things that seem common and write about it within anthropology. And that becomes incredibly important for intercultural history, because we can do a comparison a lot easier. This is where video games start to come in. I'm a native video gamer, but I want to point out that video games are new, and they act sort of as a connection between cultures. If I see a fellow video gamer, we won't care that the other, that you know we have different cultural beliefs. We will care that we both like video games. This picture is from Nintendo, and it was about the Ultra Street Fighter 2 
a big showing. It was right after the uh, Nintendo Switch was finally uh, shown, and they talked about why it was around and what it was going to do. And for a brief slide, they showed uh, Street Fighter characters fighting each other. And then a little while later, they had an interview with the Nintendo Treehouse that the N Nintendo Treehouse group, who are the translators from Japanese to English, and uh, actually cultural connectors, you know, okay, this is what the Japanese said, but how do we make this sound American? And the guy on the far left and the guy on the far right are from the Nintendo Treehouse, and they're presenting this very Japanese concept of international fighters fighting each other. And two of the guys, uh, the two guys in the center are Japanese, and they helped create the game, and one of them actually helped make the Street Fighter II game. And then the guy, second to the right, is Chinese, but he grew up in, uh, in Japan, and he also speaks English. And that doesn't sound like a lot to you, but I want you to go, I want to go through this list. We have a black guy, we have two Japanese, we have a Chinese Japanese, and we have a Filipino. Without even thinking about it, I want you to realize how many cultures are in this picture and absolutely nobody cares. We care that there's Ultra Street Fighter 2 on this display and that we're interviewing the guys who created it. We don't care about their cultures. We care about the video game. And because of that, we can now let cultures connect to each other and we can find a way to talk about our cultures without having to feel stymied by, you know, the walls and rules we make between each other because we all like this subject. In the same way, when I was in the Navajo Reservation and I had difficulties connecting with people, I would notice that they had video games and we, would, we could talk about video games or I would play video games with them and they'd be like, oh, okay, yeah, you, you like Halo. Oh, you're good at Street Fighter. Well, no, not Street Fighter, uh, Tony Hawk. Oh, hey, uh, we're playing StarCraft. And then they'd, speaking, they'd be speaking Navajo to each other while fighting somebody else. And I, I was just like, good job, co-talkers. <laughs> I mean, it was it was impressive. There were there were clans in the Navajo reservation where they would talk to each other in Navajo so that the their opponents wouldn't understand them, and that that is a really cool thing. So here we have Nintendo trying to make a display about a video game console, and we've brought four different cultures together, and we haven't even thought about it because we're more worried about the video game, and Nintendo does this all the time. Video games do this all the time. We don't care that, you know, that one guy is from Liverpool, England. We care that he killed the Dreamcast or that he couldn't play Guitar Hero very well. We don't care that, you know, that German guy said that thing. We care that he made this really cool aspect of a video game. And that's, that's why video games as a connection become important. They take away the walls and they give us a chance to understand each other. And it, it just helps me out a lot with my studies and also as a way to relax. Then we have video games as life. This is a picture from the Portland Retro Gaming Expo. Uh, oh, wow. I just realized I got them. Uh, the two people in blue shirts playing. I, I actually don't know what they're playing. They're just walking around. They were a... Uh, they're basically married. It's a long story. And, you know, they're just walking around and you'll look, you'll see various ages all around you. And nobody cares because they're more worried about the video games. The reason why is this is a cultural event for people who like video games. Video game, video games has become a, a cultural thing. It has created its own culture, its own people who view video games as life. That means that you can have a native or somebody who grew up with video games as part of their life and who, you know, you wear something video games like, video game like, and they will connect with you instantaneously. In the same way, if you're walking around in a mall and you're Navajo and you see somebody with, you know, a silver uh, medallion and it's of a Navajo design, your immediate response is to go, oh, hey, where'd you get that? Oh, 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 you're you're from you're from you know Lukachukai. Ah, oh, I'm from uh, Tuba City. You know that they just recognize that connection. And these people in this picture 
are all connecting to, to each other, even though they have very different, you know, aspects on life. They're from various ages. They have all sorts of different political viewpoints. They have all these differences. And had we have, had they have met some other way, Stalin's divide would be there. But in this context, within this culture, they are the same thing. They are the same people. Because video games are their, is their culture. And that's, that's a fascinating thing. And the reason why I study video games as a native is I look at it as if this was some tribe. And I'm a native of this tribe. And I'm trying to explain to people what it's like to be a native of these tribes. And I go to various places where I know video, games or video gamers will meet. And I just go, oh, this is what it's like to be in an arcade. This is what it's like to be in a video game collector's area. I've made many friends and I've, I've strengthened friendships and I actually really enjoy going to these conventions. It's, it's a chance to see friends. And I think that's pretty much why I enjoy video games within intercultural history, but also just as a fan. So I think I answered all the questions and we're hitting at over an hour, nearly an hour and a half. I think that's a, a good thing because I was really worried we we're going to get two hours, but an hour and a half is good. And thank you for listening. You, you, you can see that video games, you know, help connect us through difficulties because we've made these walls and rules and divides and Pokemon, or, you know, we've made uh, battling each other as a sport at times. And here we are, have a place where, you know, these divides can happen all the time, but everybody is connected because of video games. And I hope you enjoyed the methodologies that we use, and I hope you use them. And I hope you enjoyed the theories and, you know, the concepts of intercultural history. Hopefully, uh, the next video will be shorter. Uh, I don't know what it's going to be about, but it will be shorter. And it will be uh, pretty good. All right. Uh, aloha. Catch you later.